Welcome to Ask GCN Anything. This week we are answering your questions. Welcome. So our first question is from Ronan Murphy. Uh, says he's been reading about post-ride rituals with regard to getting rid of lactic acid, i.e. getting your legs up on the wall for five minutes, wearing compression socks, or passing out on the sofa. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on these as well as any of your own rituals once you get off the bike at home. Well, I think post-ride rituals are all well and good, Ronan, but I wouldn't necessarily go for those as my chosen ones. I'd try and you know, get some food, have a shower, maybe yep. clean my bike. Just go for the bigger tasks first. What about you, Emma? Yeah, I have to say I do like cleaning my bike while I'm still covered in road filth, if, that's, if it's been a dirty ride. But, but scientifically speaking, if you want to recover faster, the priority is uh, rehydrate, refuel and rest. But I would add a shower in there somewhere probably before the before the refueling so I tend to get home rinse the bike down have a shower myself um, whilst drinking loads of uh, either water or rehydration mix and then eat cool and then rest so, so yeah you got a pretty set routine then yeah yeah getting out of the cycling kit and getting showered is fairly high priority <laughs> but yeah the um so um you asked about compression socks and legs up against the wall so that can that, I think compression socks and Raising legs can help with circulation. Um, it doesn't do much about lactic acid, actually, or lactate, um, which is the result of a highly intense effort. That lactate will actually clear from your body within an hour of you producing it naturally. So some gentle movement, i.e. warm down, helps. But often you'll have got home from your ride, by the time you get back, the lactate will have gone. And the soreness you feel the day after is actually nothing to do with lactate. lactate. It's um, delayed onset muscle soreness is caused by micro traumas in the muscle, which leads to inflammation, and lactate has really, they've shown it's got nothing to do with it. So um, whilst there's a coincidence that the same kind of training or racing will produce muscle soreness and lactate, um, then the two aren't related. The best thing you can do to try and relieve muscle soreness, um, well, there isn't much like hot and cold temperature changes, uh, massage, uh, but ma mostly rehydrate, refuel and rest. And muscle soreness is like the precursor to you eventually getting faster exactly. if you do all of the recovery correctly. Exactly. And nutrition is a great way to enhance your recovery. It is, And we've yep. got a video playing behind us yep. that's going to play for you now, yep. which is how to improve your post-ride recovery through nutrition. Recovery is arguably the most important part of training. You can train as hard as you want, but if you don't recover properly, then you won't improve. In fact, you could actually get worse. Yeah, of course, recovery without training isn't going to get you very far either, but the key is to find a balance between the two. So the faster you recover, the harder you can train, and then theoretically at least, the better the cyclist that you become. So next up, we've got a question from Braden Watcott, who says, Hey GCN, I'm a cross-country mountain bike racer. My question is, what sort of workouts on your channel would be the best for me to do since GMBN don't have any? Don't have any yet. If you do want some, let the GMBN guys know and they'll see what they can do. Emma's already nominated me for this answer, Braden, so I'm afraid that it might be a little less scientific than the one before. No, but he knows what he's talking about when it comes to mountain biking, and I have no clue, so listen to Tom. <laughs> so cross-country is similar in many respects to cyclocross. It's actually increasingly similar now because the courses are getting shorter, the races are slightly shorter than they were, say, five, ten years ago, and it's all about those repeated explosive efforts. And we've got some cyclocross training videos, so I'm going to throw you straight to size video on four cyclocross training drills. Coming up are four training sessions that will get you fitter and faster on your cross bike. The first three are all designed to be done off-road. Oh yeah, winner. They are pretty intense though, so do make sure that you're nicely warmed up before you start any of the intervals. Session three is another one that's going to get us fitter and work on a key cyclocross skill, clipping in. Actually, who are we kidding? That's not just a cyclocross skill, that is a life skill. Anyway, you want to find a nice simple section of trail or gravel road that's not in any way technical. You then need to come after a good warm-up to a complete stop. Take a deep breath and get ready for interval one. Now the next question is from Darren Horrocks. I think it's to me. Did, did you yeah, I think I should read this one out. Actually, okay. Emma. It says, "How did it feel joining GCN after smashing Simon Matt at the KOM Challenge?" Um, well, I, I'll be honest. I didn't really go to the KOM Challenge to smash them. I went as a, I was a professional athlete last year, and it was my job. And they invited me to the race, and they, I really wanted to win it. So, I didn't really see Simon Matt in the race because I started in the front, and I was kind of trying to stay in front of the race. And I think they had a slightly different reason to be there in that they were, they were basically producing a really inf 
informative and, and inspiring video on the race and I was just sweating my guts out of the front. I don't think I'd have made a pretty video. So um, yeah, it was very different last year because I was training full time and they, they weren't, so. When you say that, you know, you started at the front so you didn't see them, do you feel that kind of, you know, basically as a byproduct of smashing Simon Matt, you know, you weren't even aware that they were there because you smashed them that badly? Yeah, I don't think I saw them in the race. Although I did actually get to the back at one point in the neutral because I had to stop for a pee and I had to go all around the peloton again. But I didn't see them, I was in a bit of a hurry. But yeah, no, I was very much race faced at that, at that race. And you've got to remember that, I, yeah, it was, it was a focus of my autumn. And for them, it was very much, uh, you know, they had, they had to talk to you guys whilst riding up that big mountain. It's very different. And they were on funny, you know, they were on strange bikes, strange light, bars. They were on light bikes. Yeah. They had every advantage and you still didn't even yeah. realise they were in the I was race because they were that far behind. Anyway, Another yeah. year. We'll, we'll give them some training time just, this time and we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Let's just say they're excellent colleagues, so I'm very grateful that they put up with me despite me banging on about the Taiwan KOM all the time. <laughs> and us talking <laughs> about it all the time as well. Thanks for the question, Darren. Yep. Next up is Mark Evasion, who first of all asks, why has Ask GCN disappeared? The answer, Mark, is it didn't entirely disappear. We've got an Ask GCN Tech video on GCN Tech. And we're back last GCN here. So keep the questions coming in. Yep. He's also said, I'm moving to warmer climbs after four months through a harsh winter. Should I ease back into the warmer weather or just go for it? What do you reckon, Emma? Uh, well, it does take a little bit of time to adapt to temperature changes. So um, recent studies have shown it's about 10 days to adapt to, to, to heat. Whether that's going from a temperate climate to a very hot climate or going from very cold to just temperate. Uh, so give yourself some time. Don't expect to feel great for the first 10 days. Um, and, and give your body time to adapt. So the adaptations you'll expect are um, you'll get an increased blood volume when you train in high temperatures and increased sweat rate, and that's obviously to help you cool down. Um, if you want to, to pre-train that, you can, you can actually do very effective heat adaptation in very little time by every day having 10 to 20 to 30 minutes in either a sauna or, if you don't have a sauna or access to a sauna, uh, sitting in a hot bath in a steamy bathroom. It's pretty unpleasant but um, it's very effective. So I know um, that's how we trained with the national team before the Beijing Olympics. We, uh, we had a this horrible heat training chamber. It was basically a tent with a heater and a humidifier and a load of turbo trainers. And we all sat there turboing away for about an hour and a half. Each, well, yeah, maybe, maybe it was only an hour, but it felt like forever. It was so sweaty. Um, yeah, so we'd measure how much water we'd drunk and measure our weight before and after. And that way you could work out your sweat rate and you can actually see, it was over two weeks, you could see sweat rate increasing, which is an adaptation to the heat. Uh, I have to say that my shoes, when my cycling shoes were ruined. They were so disgustingly smelly after that. Uh, but it worked, so I, you can try that. Put your turbo trainer in your bathroom, run a hot bath, Turn the heat sweat up. it out for 10 days. I, you don't have to do it all day, every day. Just 10 to 20 minutes a day will do the trick. I'm not sure Sai mentions that in this video, so it's good information. <laughs> However, Sai behind us has got a video on how to train for hot and humid conditions. It's that time of year when many of us in the Northern Hemisphere are contending with really hot temperatures and possibly humidity as well. They make for some tough riding conditions, and so here are some tips on how to cope with it. Let's start with clothing, shall we? It's your first port of call even before setting out. So you want to have a lightweight jersey, definitely with a full length zip, and then pair it with shorts that have got really minimal bib strapping on there. So that means that in combination, you can get loads of air circulating, even at lower speeds. Okay, Emma, this is one for you. It's right. from Clinton McDermott, who's asking, has Emma ever done any bike packing? If so, where? Well. Luckily, otherwise it'd be a really boring answer. I have. <laughs> I had my first attempt at bikepacking uh, last year in October, straight after the Taiwan KOM actually. Stayed in Taiwan for eight days and carried on cycling around the southern end of the island um, with my race bike with a giant saddlebag with um, three people who I barely knew. It was, it was fantastic. Taiwan is beautiful, people are friendly, roads are amazing, lots of mountains, good food. I really enjoyed it and I think just generally as an experience, um, I'll definitely be going bikepacking again. It was really good. Very um, minimalist luggage, not much to worry about, sort of not really training but out enjoying fresh air. Loved it. And many, meeting cultures, yeah. How many kilometres were you doing a day on your bikepacking trip? Well, I got told off on day two for asking that question, how far were we going to go? I, I didn't plan the route and uh, the person who had planned the route, when I said, how far are we going? I need to train. He said, Emma, we count smiles, not miles. And that told me, so I just shut up and just carried on pedaling. And you know, I but that's what I was I most enjoyed about it was that by the end of the week, I didn't really, 
I wasn't thinking about training, I was just thinking about getting somewhere by bike and it was really relaxing. And after years of training, that was actually quite good for me, I think. Yeah. So measure your bike packing in smiles? In smiles, yeah. Not miles. <laughs> I've, conversely, I've never been bike packing, although your question wasn't directed at me. Um, you should try it, it's great. Yeah, I, I hope <laughs> to try it one day. <laughs> Next up, we've got Panos Tizio. I hope I've said your name correctly, who asks, favourite training place? Again, okay, I'll take it. Um, to be honest, I've been lucky enough, especially with GCN, to go to a lot of really cool places to ride my bike, and some particularly warm places. So we've ridden in Abu Dhabi, which was amazing, so vastly different to anything that I'd cycled here in Europe. We cycled in America, you know, Mallorca, which is a cyclist paradise, Alta Badia in the Dolomites, so our location partner, some stunning roads, climbs and descents there. But I think now, for me, probably my favorite place to train is almost is home. And it's just because those are the roads I used to ride as a kid and just brings back memories. And I just really like riding there. So that's the Peak District in Derbyshire, where there's some very steep hills. Beautiful place. Yeah. How about you, Emma? Um, I have loads of places I love training. I think probably two stand out. So I've lived in Switzerland for quite a few years now. and. My little back roads there, my secret climbs. I really love those. And uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and I um, also spend a bit of time training in Perth, where I've got family. Um, and I love Perth because the group ride scene is fantastic. And um, I, I really love knowing that there's a like there's a hard group ride that I can join. So you don't need to worry about doing intervals that day because you just have to get out of bed on time, find a cycling kit, roll out at six in the morning, and. You know, it's hard training without the mental effort, so I really love training in Perth as well. That's cool. Yeah, I think that your point on group rides is spot on, because yeah. if you can find a good group ride, it does oh, save you all the thinking. Yeah. That and it's train. fun, you know, training other people is often, I, I find it much more fun than training alone, because I my company is really tedious, so other people always improve it, and then there's someone to stop for coffee with afterwards. So. Well, I'm sure that's not true, but we want to know your favourite place to train as well, yep. so do tell us down in the comments, yep. and let us know if there's somewhere that we should go and check out as GCN. Yeah, do. Okay, I think we are heading towards one of our final questions. This one is from Ivailo Dobrev. Uh, hello guys, first up, keep up the great shows. Thanks. For a beginner cyclist like me, they are a Bible. Thanks again. And second, I have a question. I cannot find info on, about, on the World Wide Web. How often should we change when drafting? Would it be measured by distance or time? Ooh, that's a big question. It's a bit like asking how long is a piece of string, really, uh, in that you know, taking turns on the front is, it, it very much depends on the ride, how many people are there. Um, I, w I would always say measure it on time because that's what, you know, your, your time and effort level is the relevant question. And um, it depends what you're doing. If it's, um, if it's just two of you doing a two up time trial, then shorter efforts are normally good, you know, if you want to go as fast as possible. If it's about getting on with the rest of the group, then I'd say, you know, if you're on a big group ride, then you know, stay on the front for five or ten or even twenty minutes. Because on group rides, what tends to happen is you have two lines of riders, if, if that's allowed in the country you live in, and you chat to the person next to you. And after your ten minutes, you peel off the front and go to the back and keep chatting. So if you're changing constantly, it ruins the conversation. Yeah, and I think um, you know, Ivana, you've said that you're just starting out, but I think you know, once you've been cycling even for a couple of months or a few months, something you'll have quite a good gauge on, you know, when you personally are beginning to suffer a bit on the front or when your friends are beginning to slow up a bit. Yep. So if you set a marker of time first up, so, you know, like I said, with a couple of you, that's probably shorter turn, so one, two, th maybe three minutes. And But if you notice that, say, at two minutes, someone else is starting to slow down a bit, just, you know, give them a bit of a tap, let them know that you're coming through yep. and make sure you keep the pace because the moment you start to lose momentum, yep. that's when things actually start to get really difficult. Yeah, exactly. You can, go, you can go on feel and I think what I found with riding with different groups and different training rides is that almost every group has a different rule. So you can make your own rule, go riding with your friends and make it 13 minutes and three seconds if you want, you know, <laughs> up to you. But you can base it very much on feel. Yeah, I think, yeah, start with time, then work on feel. Well, Emma, that was our last question for today but we do need your questions so let us know down in the comments or if you'd like to submit them on any form of social media really the hashtag you can use is talkback the spelling's a little bit funny and it's on the screen at the moment you could even send us a letter but that's not as common that'd be quite cool though <laughs> and ask GCM by post uh, anyway yes if you like this um, you might like to check out some of our other videos for example there's one that I made about how to improve your confidence on descents with Matt something I care about very deeply having had a problem with it myself 
That's a very important video and a very good video. You should definitely check it out. If you want to find out whenever a GCM video goes live, hit our logo, which is on screen now to subscribe and also hit the notification bell. That way you'll find out every single time a video goes out. And if you'd like to check out our shop, there's a link on screen for that now too.